Lecture 2 is on radio frequency radiation and 5G. First, let's answer two polling questions. We are now turning our attention to radio frequency radiation. The key biological effects associated with radio frequency radiation include various cancers, the most common of which is a glioma brain tumor, Many studies are showing impaired reproduction with damage to sperm, miscarriages, and behavioral problems in offspring. And finally, there is electrohypersensitivity, which affects many systems in the body. Our exposure, our greatest exposure to radio frequency radiation comes from wireless devices in the home, smart meters and smart appliances, Wi-Fi at school, work, and in the office, from nearby cell phone antennas and other antennas, and from neighbors in multi-unit dwellings. Fortunately, we have some control within our home. And what are some of the more common devices in our home? Wi-Fi, cordless phones, wireless baby monitors, wireless games, wireless home security systems. And some people have these devices emitting 24-7. In Europe, you can purchase cordless phones that emit radiation only when they are being used. And they have baby monitors that are sound activated, which means they do not emit any radiation until the infant makes a sound. In North America, these same devices emit microwave radiation constantly. We tried to bring some of these sound-activated baby monitors to North America, but it was illegal to import them. When we inquired, we were told that the signals interfere with FCC regulations. We already mentioned in last lecture that smart homes are electromagnetically unhygienic. Many wearables radiate electrosmog. The wireless earpiece is always in the same location, so your brain cells closest to the earpiece are exposed to the highest levels. At the very least, if you have only one earpiece, it is important to change ears to allow your cells to repair any damage that may have been caused by the radiation. The mommy cell phone for children should be banned unless it is radiating only when in use. And while people are trying to maintain their health by exercising and getting plenty of sleep, these devices may be interfering with that process. This is how kids spend their time socializing. This provides too much screen time and not enough outdoor activity or face-to-face -face interactions. If you read the user manual on cell phones and tablets, Many provide a warning to keep it a certain distance from your body. The recommended distance for cell phones ranges from 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters, and for tablets, it is about 20 centimeters. And now we have some polling questions. Mercury is a neurotoxin. We are exposed to mercury if we have mercury amalgam fillings, if we eat a lot of seafood and with occupational exposure. Mercury passes uh, through the blood-brain barrier and it can be passed via the placenta onto the fetus and affect fetal development. Mercury interacts synergistically with radio frequencies. Several studies have documented that radio frequency radiation mobilizes mercury from fillings. In this study published in 2008 after dental mercury amalgam restoration. Subjects were exposed to magnetic resonance imaging in phase one of the study, and a different group was exposed to mobile phone radiation in phase two. Both groups released more mercury into their saliva or urine than the controls. Here are the results for female university students who used mobile phones, red bar. The mercury content of urine was much higher than the controls, shown in grey, who were not uh, using a mobile phone. And this was statistically significant on day 2, 3, and 4 after dental amalgam restoration.
the same authors hypothesized in this 2016 publication that if dental mercury is mobilized by radio frequency radiation in a pregnant woman, this could increase the fetal mercury load resulting in neurological and hormonal disruptions and possibly contributing to autistic spectrum disorder. Others will be talking about how to minimize your exposure at the conference in January. I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that instead of holding your cell phone in speaker mode, you can place it in the bowl and this will amplify the sound as the speakers are at the base of the phone. I've tried it and it works. You can also connect your iPhone, iPad, iPod to Ethernet with special adapters and avoid the radiation. Details are provided at the Electrosensitive Society website at the bottom of this slide and it will be presented at the conference in January. A good mantra, if it's stationary, wire it. And that applies to smart meters, smart appliances, printers, keyboards, home phones. And there are several options for wired internet from ethernet cables to fiber optics to power line adapters. Use wired instead of wireless whenever possible. Now let's turn our attention to smart meters. What is smart about a smart meter? Smart simply means two-way communication. It can be wired or wireless. Here is a simplified example of how a smart metering system works. You have a smart meter on your home. It communicates with a receiver on a nearby hydro pole. The message is sent to the utility and they can then communicate with your smart meter and turn appliances on or off. However, some systems use a radio frequency mesh. In this type of system, your smart meter is communicating with other smart meters and not just with the utility. As a result, your smart meter is working overtime and your home is receiving a lot more radiation. It's important to find out which of these two types of smart meters you have on your home. And if we have a mesh system, this is how much radiation is being transmitted and how frequently. This smart meter was placed on this house a few months earlier, and you can see that the shrub near the smart meter is beginning to die back. It was completely dead within a year. Here is another example, courtesy of Dr. Carl Murray, showing that radiation emitted constantly by a smart meter in a mesh network. The maximum radiation at four feet was 38 microwatts per centimeter squared. To put this in perspective, heart palpitations have been documented at five microwatts per centimeter squared and the Federal Communication Commission guidelines for 900 megahertz frequency is 600 microwatts per centimeter squared. Smart meters and smart appliances are making people sick. And we now have smart meters not only for electricity, but for water and gas as well. Smart meters emit microwave radiation. They generate dirty electricity and they talk to smart appliances, all of which increase our exposure to electrosmog. This visual is one of the better representations of the difference between an analog meter and a smart meter. You see an apartment building in a house with an analog meter in this slide. Here we have the same two buildings, but with a smart meter. The red represents dirty electricity and the orange represents microwave radiation. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine recommended in 2012 that accommodations be made for health consi considerations regarding smart meters and other devices emitting electrosmog. That we recognize electrohypersensitivity as a growing health problem worldwide. And that we consider using wired technology for data transmission. Many smart meters are not UL approved 
and none have CSA approval that I'm aware of. And smart meters have been known to cause fires. People are complaining that their smart meter readings are inaccurate. Here is an example of how the readings changed after an analog meter was replaced by a smart meter. If these higher readings are due to interference, then placing a choke on the conduit near the smart meter can reduce this interference and save the homeowner some money. Radiation from a smart meter can be shielded and filtered uh, but these are both band-aid solutions. If you plan to shield your smart meter, it is important not to shield it completely because if it is not able to provide the information to the utility, they will send out a repair crew and remove your shielding. The real solution is to wire smart meters and smart appliances. If it doesn't move, it doesn't need to be wireless. An excellent resource is Tim Sheckley's book, Reinventing Wires, the Future of Landlines and Networks. And you should be able to get a free copy of this book on the internet or from the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy in Washington, DC. Now let's turn our attention to Wi-Fi in schools. I'm deeply concerned about Wi-Fi in schools and the unnecessary radiation of students and teachers. The two hotspots in a school are near the base station and near the computer or tablet connected to the base station. Wi-Fi is much more dangerous at school than in the home. The base stations are more powerful. There are more access points, more users. It's always on. And students sitting next to their neighbors would be exposed to additional radiation from computers and tablets. In Canada, we have about eight sudden cardiac arrests among young people each year. When Wi-Fi was introduced to schools in Simcoe County, a number of students started complaining of feeling unwell in school and having heart palpitations while in school, but not at home. One of the parents, a reporter, went around and got this information. In Simcoe County, 2008, 10-year-old girl dies in gym. Wi-Fi in school. 2009, 13-year-old boy revived with a defibrillator. He now has a pacemaker. 2010, 15-year-old boy revived with CPR. In MTV school, six-year-old girl, musical heart, headaches, dizziness, only at school. 12-year-old boy with tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate. 12-year-old girl, nausea, vomiting, no fever, insomnia, blurred vision, tachycardia, only in school. And 13-year-old boy, heart pounding, insomnia, headaches, they moved away and his symptoms abated. This is not psychosomatic. I work with people who are electrically hypersensitive and they complain of heart palpitations, arrhythmias, pain or pressure in the chest, high and low blood pressure. Many feel as though they are having a heart attack or an anxiety attack. So we did a proof of concept study and asked the question, does radiation from a cordless phone affect the heart? We decided to use a cordless phone because when you plug the base station of a cordless phone into an electrical outlet, it radiates whether or not anyone is using it. And we wanted to know if this radiation affected the heart. We used 2.4 gigahertz frequency, that is the same as Wi-Fi. Our exposure was at 3 microwatts per centimeter squared. The guideline at this frequency is 1000 microwatts per centimeter squared. So the government is telling us we can be exposed to levels as high as 1000 without having any adverse health effects. Our exposure in the study was less than 1% of federal guidelines. Duration of exposure was between three to four minutes in our study. Normally the exposure is averaged over a time period and this is six minutes in Canada and 30 minutes in the United States. This was a double blind study. Neither the person being tested nor the doctor evaluating the results knew when the cell phone was turned on or off. I'm going to show you results from two subjects. 
This is subject A. This subject is exposed to three minute time intervals to either sham exposure or exposure to the radiation from a cordless phone. The numbers in white represent heartbeats for each interval. You can see the subject was exposed during intervals three and four, and there is no change in the heart rate or the irregularity of the heartbeats. This person is non-reactive. Subject B has a very different response. This person was exposed to radiation during intervals three and five in each case. His heart rate increased rapidly and became irregular. Also showed that there was a sympathetic upregulation and a parasympathetic downregulation. This is a typical stress response. This person is electrically hypersensitive. Here we have caveman Bob. He had a hard day at work with lots of stressors and he is going to recover in his cave. This is Bob's cave mate and she will take care of the problem. What we have here is an example of short-term acute stress and this doesn't cause a problem. As a matter of fact, this is healthy. Bob has time to engage his parasympathetic nervous system that helps him rest, digest, and heal. Here we have Bob's twin brother, also called Bob, who has had an equally stressful day. However, this is what Bob comes home to, so he doesn't have time to recover. This is an example of long-term chronic stress that leads to illness. This is the equivalent of having a cell phone tower near your home or Wi-Fi in your home. If you are in sympathetic overload on a constant basis, you will not be able to heal properly, and it's quite likely that you will become ill over time. Now let's turn our attention to the school that has a Wi-Fi tower, Wi-Fi in the classroom, and a cell phone tower nearby. This is going to cause physiological stress to some percentage of the student and teacher population. That stress is going to adversely affect the body, the mind, behavior, and emotions. And then that student goes back to school. Now we expect these students to perform well because we have given them all the technological advantages. Unfortunately, we have placed them in a toxic environment. Out-of-hospital cardiac deaths seem to be increasing among young adults ages 15 to 34. During the period 1989-90 and versus the period 1997-98, an eight-year interval, age-adjusted out-of-hospital cardiac death rates increased in both men and women between 11 and 33 percent. In a separate study, sudden cardiac attributed to cardiovascular event among athletes is also increasing. In this conference on the biological effects and health implications of microwave radiation, scientists provide this warning. In the interest of occupational hygiene, investigators have recommended that cardiovascular abnormalities be used as screening criteria to exclude people from occupations involving radio frequency exposures. In 1969, the government knew that radio frequencies affect the heart and that some people are more susceptible than others. I strongly believe that students need to be screened at school to ensure they do not have an underlying heart condition that may be exacerbated with Wi-Fi exposure. According to the National Stroke Association, strokes are on the rise among young adults. Here is an example of why this might be the case. We measured um, live blood and published the results in 2013. Radiation from wireless technology affects the blood, the heart, and the automatic nervous system. Here is an example of how it affects the blood. We took a drop of blood, placed it on a slide, and looked at it under the microscope. This is an Im image of my live blood in an electromagnetically clean environment. 
And this is what my blood looks like after 10 minute exposure to Wi-Fi. What you see here are red blood cells sticking together, and this is called rouleau formation. The consequences of this are sluggish circulation, lower oxygen transport, reduced waste removal. The symptoms include some combination of headaches, fatigue, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, and the worst possible case is a heart, heart attack or a stroke. Dr. Stephen Sinatra, an internationally recognized cardiologist, said that our blood should have the consistency of red wine, but what he notices in his patients is that their blood resembles ketchup. This is Rouleau. And as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are alternatives to wireless, Ethernet cables, power line adapters, and fiber optics. It would be in the best interest of communities to develop a fiber optic highway for fast, secure, and safe service with much less radiation. Next, we are going to turn our attention to cell phone antennas. Years from now, we are going to look back and ask ourselves, what were we thinking placing cell towers so close to homes, schools, and hospitals? Here we have a cellular base station on top of a building. It consists of a tower for support. In Europe, they call this a mast. There are antennas for both transmitting and receiving signals, and there is a cabin for the electrical supplies. This tower has three types of antennas. The antennas that look like poles are omnidirectional and radiate in all directions like a light bulb. The dish-shaped antennas are point-to-point -point like a laser pointer and must be within line of sight of each other. The rectangular antennas, like a flashlight, radiate in a sector, usually 120 degrees, and are common along highways. When we talk about cells, there are different geographical sizes. We have the world cell that relies on satellites macro cells that can transmit information up to 20 kilometers, micro cells that transmit up to one kilometer, pico cells that transmit about 100 meters, this would include your cordless phone and your wireless baby monitor, and femto cells that transmit up to 10 meters, and this would be your Bluetooth devices. When the industry learned that people didn't want a big tower near their home, the telecom uh, fellows got together and began to disguise towers as natural objects that we would normally see in the environment. Here are more stealth antennas. Distance is your friend. Ideally, you should be at least 500 meters from a cell tower and I used to recommend at least two kilometers from radar and broadcast antennas, although as they make them more powerful, further away may be safer. Now let's turn our attention to 5G and millimeter waves. What is 5G? 5G refers to fifth generation communication technology. It follows the previous generations, but is much faster with speeds of one gigabit per second. I currently get 500 megabits per second, or half a gigabit, on my 4G fiber optics connected to my home, and I don't need anything faster than that. Five G differs considerably from previous generations and it is going to evolve so few people know what we are truly in for. What we do know is that 5G will not replace 4G technology. Indeed, it will intensify our use of 4G and expose us to additional frequencies and higher intensities. 5G will use multiple frequencies that fall into three categories, sub one gigahertz, sub six gigahertz and millimeter waves. And it will be, it will involve the densification of small cell antennas. So expect a small cell antenna to come to your neighborhood and possibly to come to your home. 
5G infrastructure consists of satellites, macro cell sites, small cells, and fiber optics. Fiber optics are the safest with no radiation. Satellites are relatively safe provided we have low exposure from them. Macro cell sites are dangerous near the antennas. And small cells are of greatest concern because these are going to be near where people live. There will be both winners and losers with 5G. The driving force is the amount of money some companies will make, and the downside is that this technology is going to significantly increase our exposure to microwave and millimeter wave radiation. We are having a love affair with wireless. It started with cell phones, but we have no choice as to where towers are placed. Then we had Wi-Fi, but we have no choice about Wi-Fi in schools. Smart meters and smart appliances, this is something that the electric utilities have foisted on us. We have no choice about smart meters and smart appliances in our home. Both are dumb ideas and they are dangerous. 5G is now something that the telecom providers are insisting we need for faster download speeds and the Internet of Things. We have no choice about the placement of these small cells and how many satellites they are going to be deploying. 5G is going to expose us to more radiation uh, when current levels are already harmful, and we have no choice in the matter. There are many key concerns about wireless smart technology. Health effects, addiction, social skills, safety, security, privacy, effects on plants and animals, energy consumption, and global warming. I'm going to uh, talk about a few of these very briefly. But first, a polling question. We have ev evidence that Wi-Fi radiation interferes with plant growth. We exposed seeds to Wi-Fi radiation on the left and compared the growth to a control population on the right that was not exposed to radiation. The control plants were much larger at the end of the 30-day experiment than the exposed plants. The Wi-Fi exposed plants didn't have a root system and these plants could not survive in nature. We also tested the response of bees. Here we have two colonies. The hive at the top left is the control hive that was shielded from radiation with special paint and with metallic tape. The hive on, in the middle of this slide was exposed to radiation from Wi-Fi router, cordless phone, and a wireless baby monitor. And here you can see how agitated the bees are. They began to swarm after a few minutes of exposure and became very aggressive. And here are the bees in the control hive only a few meters away. They are more placid and seem undisturbed. I'm now going to shift to concerns about privacy. The headbands these students are wearing are monitoring their brainwave activity. Each band has a colored light in the front. White means the student is offline. Blue means the student is distracted, green the student is focused, and red the student is deeply focused. The information is sent to the teacher's tablet, and then the teacher sends the information to the parent's cell phone. I can only imagine how much this increases microwave radiation in the classroom, making it difficult for students to focus. In China, you can make a purchase without cash or a credit card, Instead, they use facial recognition, and with facial recognition, they don't need an ID chip since the cameras will identify people even in a crowd, as you can see here. Here is the facial recognition map of the world. Green represents countries that currently use facial recognition. You'll notice that very few countries or communities are banning this technology. We are promised that 5G will bring us driverless cars, smart homes, 
smart cities, remote surgery, unfortunately, it is probably going to make a lot of us sick. <clears throat> Currently, millimeter waves are used at airports. We have the simple metal scanner, the millimeter wave scanner. Employees are asked to calibrate these scanners with each employee being exposed about 20 times a day. These airport employees are complaining of illness, but little is being done to help them. Another use of microwave millimeter waves is the active denial system used by the US military. They use 95 gigahertz frequency that has a range of 500 meters. The beam is directed at a person or a crowd and it instantly heats the skin, causing intense pain. The beam damages eyes and testicles and is likely to have other effects that we don't yet know about. We can't end this lecture without considering guidelines. Here we have biological effects shown in red and guidelines for radio frequency radiation shown in purple. Note that this is using a log scale, so each line differs by a factor of 10. What is most unusual about this graph is that guidelines vary more than five orders of magnitude. This widespread in guidelines is unheard of in chemical toxicology. Also, the guidelines do not protect against the health effects noted here, which occur at much lower intensities than the guidelines. In some of my presentations, someone in the audience will say, if this was true, they would have told us. In 1971, the US government released a report with more than 2,000 publications on the biological and health effects of microwave radiation. You can get information uh, from this uh, report on my website and on zoriglazier.com website. I'll provide more information later. More recently, a group of international scientists in this field sent an appeal to the World Health Organization and to the United Nations asking for safer guidelines, among other requests. Cell phone providers are asking people to keep the phone at least 1.5 centimeters from the body and tablets at least 20 centimeters from the body. Insurance agencies are not insuring against health effects from wireless technology. Various medical academies are stating that radio frequency guidelines do not protect children. And some governments are removing and banning Wi-Fi in schools. They are telling us. We aren't listening. This is where we are at present. I show people who have an adverse response to electrosmog as being under the waterline. So what does the future hold? If we do nothing about guidelines, if we allow Wi-Fi to be install installed in schools, in parks, on buses, on airplanes, and in hospitals, if we have wireless smart meters, smart appliances, and smart homes, with 5G everywhere and satellites bombarding us from space and with driverless cars and with wireless wearables, I, I doubt the society will survive. Far too many people are going to become sick. And that lone person who has his head above the waterline isn't going to be able to support the rest of us. Alternatively, we can establish radio frequency free zones green zones. We can lower guidelines. We can provide wired internet access everywhere, especially in schools. We can convert wired smart meters and wired smart appliances. We can place a moratorium on 5G. Then we can reduce exposure to tolerable and possibly no effect levels. Remember, if it doesn't move, it doesn't need to be wireless. And now we turn to our last two polling questions.
And when you come back, we will re resume with lecture three on extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields. We'll take a short break. <laughs>